So I'm here to tell you about the War of the Currents, uh, is what the name of the battle between Tesla and Edison that happened at the end of the 19th century. And uh, it's, uh, it was, that was the, kind of the brunt of their, uh, of their uh, rivalry. Their whole story, I can't tell their whole story. Both of these guys are very interesting guys. Um, was, we were just talking about who my favorite was between these two. And you can't pick a favorite between these two guys. You guys are both, in truth, both absolutely brilliant, brilliant people. And uh, they both came from different backgrounds. They were very different people, but both equally brilliant. Uh, they both made unbelievable uh, contributions to, to everything we use every day. So I'm excited to be talking about them. So here we go. The War of the Currents, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Atrial Fibrillation, which is something we'll talk about when we talk about alternating current. OK, so War of the Currents. As you can see on the left, Tesla, played by David Bowie in the movie The Prestige. On the right, Edison, the young, wacky inventor from the movie Chairman of the Board, Carrot Top's, Carrot Top's feature uh, film. I tried, I watched it, and, I, I, and then most of the reviews, they say, you won't make it through it. And I didn't make it through it, but just because of a time constraint, I, I wanna, I'm like looking forward to going back and watching the rest. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> so, we're gonna start with Edison. This is Edison as a boy. He's born in 1847. He's nine years before Tesla's born. He is born in uh, Ohio. And then he moves to Port Huron, Michigan. Port Huron is on the St. Lawrence River and Lake Huron. If you're standing in Port Huron, you can see, uh, you can see Canada right across the way. Uh, it would be Ontario. And uh, it's, it was a major, major shipping port. Uh, if you follow the lake down, you get to Detroit. And so he was born in this area that was a, a, a huge entry point for, for both the US and Canada. Uh, it was one of the Great Lakes where, where a huge shipping um, were, uh, were the major center for shipping for, for industry. And so Edison's a weird looking kid. Uh, and I only say that because he, he only went to school for a little bit. And when he was kicked out of school, he went to school for something like three months total. And uh, he, he was kicked out of, he, you know, his mom got the letter. They said, we don't like the way Al, uh, Alva, he went by Al. We don't like the way he acts and we don't like the way he looks. And so, in the, uh, there's a lot of, when you research e either of these guys, there are a lot of really interesting sources. Uh, Edison is meticulously, by the day, uh, everything he did, especially in his more productive years, to the day. Uh, Tesla is not as much. Um, the Edison, uh, they did say, uh, he, uh, the, they, they take a very uh, uh, humanistic approach. They say that today he would be diagnosed with ADHD. Maybe true. Uh, the truth was, he didn't do very well in school, and he, uh, this is him again, a little bit older. And so he, uh, he, he did, his mother was a school teacher, and she had a, there's a more technical term for it, but a photographic memory, and so did Thomas. Uh, she, she taught him. He dropped out of school. She taught him at home. He was very lucky to have a mother who was very serious about teaching him, and he, uh, he learned at a very fast rate at home. Uh, he read voraciously, and he spent a lot of his time at the library. His parents were very liberal uh, with, with what he did after that point, after they felt like he had a sufficient education, and he got a job on the railway. Now, he lived, let's look at the map here. So he lived in Port Huron, which is up here, and that's Detroit. There's another major shipping center at the time, and there was a railway that ran between the two. So he got a job on the railway uh, at 12 or something like that, and he's selling candy on the railway. And so he realizes that he's at the rail stations, that the rail stations have a link to the Associated Press. And so he gets news before just about anybody. And he puts together a little newspaper and he starts selling the newspaper on the train. Uh, and this starts to become a lucrative business. So lucrative that he realizes, hey, I'm going to all these different towns that are specialized in whatever they specialize. This place has great cantaloupes because this is where the ships come in from wherever cantaloupes come from. And this place has great cherries because it gets the boats from wherever cherries come from. And so he starts picking up produce at each of these uh, places and he hires other little kids to stand at, say, the, uh, oh God, I can't read that, Lunac station. 
And he's got kids waiting there. He drops the produce off, and they're, they're hawking the produce at, each, at the stand at each stop. So he's running this produce distribution business for free because he's getting on the train, selling his paper, selling his candy, and, and then selling, uh, selling fruit at all these places. So he starts very, very early. This is, he's 13 or 14 when he's doing this. Uh, so here he's on the train. He's got his businesses. He's got his candy. He's, I had a lot of fun with the PowerPoint on this one. He's got papers that he's selling. And now he's doing this and he's coming home every day. He's probably running the, you know, it's probably two hours down, two hours back. He's also very into uh, chemistry. He does a lot of reading about chemistry and he starts to set up a little lab in his basement. And he, uh, his mother starts to complain. He says, Thomas, it smells. The, the, the basement smells. There's all kinds of fumes coming up. You can't do the lab in the basement anymore. So he says, hey, I'm spending all my time on the train. We'll set up a little, a little lab on the back of the train. No one's going to bother me. So one day, he's got a stick of phosphorus, which is uh, very flammable when it's exposed to oxygen. And phosphorus is actually, I just learned this, uh, Molotov cocktails, you think of having a rag out of the top uh, with gasoline inside, and you light the rag. Uh, I guess the, the smarter way of doing it would be to put the phosphorus in and seal it. Then when it breaks, the phosphorus is exposed to the oxygen, and everything burns. So the same thing kind of happens. He, he goes over a bump. And the phosphorus falls on the floor, breaks open, exposed to the air, and... Oh, animated GIF. So, burns up the train. So they say, Thomas, no more experimenting. You got to go back to just the papers. Okay, so here we go. He's maybe 14, 15 years old at this point. He's peddling his papers. He's looking out the window, and he sees this little kid standing on the train tracks, young Jimmy McKenzie. And... He notices behind Jimmy McKenzie is a freight train coming at him. Jimmy doesn't realize. Edison runs out of the train, saves Jimmy McKenzie. It turns out to be a major turning point in Edison's life because Jimmy McKenzie's dad is a station manager. He's so thankful. He says, Edison, I'm going to teach you telegraphy. Uh, telegraphy, tele telegraphy uh, in addition to being hard to pronounce, is, is the like JavaScript of the time. It's like really, if you, can, if you can do this, you can do a lot of different things. You're kind of on the cutting edge. And so there he goes. He starts to learn how to use a telegraph key. Uh, and he really, at this point, gains total financial independence, even if he, if he hadn't done so already with the newspapers. So Edison is now 16, 15, uh, and he learns how to be a telegraph operator. He can now not only travel from station to station and work as a telegraph operator, they're very in need, just as JavaScript writers are now. Uh, he can go wherever he wants. So he becomes, and the term is amazing, a tramp operator. A tramp operator is someone who can travel from town to town, and when they get to the town, they can say, hey, you guys need anything telegraphed? And they say, Western Union says, why, yes, we do. And so he, uh, he, he kind of, between 16 and 20, he does what most people probably would love to do when they're 16 to 20, travel around, get great paying work in a bunch of different towns. Uh, he does it for a while until he ends up sort of running himself ragged uh, and returns back home. He comes back home to Port Huron, finds that his parents are sick, his mother is going, starting to, to lose her mind, and uh, his dad has, sort of is losing his mind too. So he realizes he's not only, he not, no longer financially, financially independent, his parents actually need to be supported at this point. He's 20. And so he says, all right, enough of Port Huron, I'm going to move to Boston. Boston is where, at this point, the, most, uh, the best colleges, uh, the highest technology is all in Boston. So he figures. I'm going to go to Boston, and I'm going to help my folks out. So he gets there, and he does pretty well. He starts working for a telegraph company, and he helps, uh, he helps, develop, helps improve the telegraphs that are in existence. But then he realizes the money's not here. The money's here. <laughs> so a year later, he comes down to New York, and that's when things start changing. Uh, this is in, I have written in my notes here, 1968. I don't think that's true. I think it's 1868. Okay, so, yes. So, from 1870 to 1873, he gets there. He develops this thing, and I'm going to explain this. I was showing this to my friend before, and, and I explained it to him, and he said, that's where you're going to lose people. That, that part's really confusing. So, he invents this thing called the universal stock ticker. It's, it's this machine right here. It takes a, uh, a what was before just a, a Morse code coming in, and what it would do is instead of a, a, a person listening, the Morse ticks would actually advance this little wheel here with letters on it. And may, I'm not sure exactly how it worked. Maybe a, a dash would advance the wheel and a dot would print. So it would actually say, 
uh, you know, GE, which wasn't around at the time, but GE, and then print their stock. Now, he did, he did a very important thing, and this is Edison's first great, great invention, is he put this little pin here so that you could have a bunch of these on every railway stop all along the line getting this message, and at the end of every message, they would be, un this thing would rotate until that pin went back to the home position, and so all of these things would always be in sync. So normally you had to have people constantly watching it like, oh, geez, is, we're supposed to be getting a, you know, a, we're getting a scramble of letters because this thing, all it gets is move ahead a letter, move ahead a letter, move ahead a letter, print. Move back a letter, move back a letter, move back a letter, print. That's all it is. So if it's out of sync, it, it prints uh, garbage. So he finally figures out, okay, we can, we can standardize this. That's in, uh, that is in, in New York, and he starts, that's his first huge invention. And it starts, it's, he starts to get a lot of clout in, uh, in tel telegraphy, and that's also where Western Union is in existence at this point. And there's a lot of money in tel telegraphy because it's the, that's all you got. That's basically if you want to send information from New York to DC, or which obviously between the finance and the government wants to, it needs to be happening all the time, uh, it's huge. Okay, so where's Tesla? We're at, uh, hold on, like, I think it's, oh, sorry. All right, 1873, here we are. So we have to back up a couple years. 1873, turn back the clock. 1856, Tesla's born. Born in Croatia, modern-day Croatia. Uh, his father is an Orthodox priest. His mother's father is an Orthodox priest. He's from a very religious family. Uh, you can actually see that's his house that he grew up in. And right next to it is, is the chapel where his father worked. So he grew up very close to, very close to the, the clergy. Uh, he, he was, in, a, uh, in contrast to Edison, a great student. He was amazing. Uh, he, he, uh, his ability to picture things in his mind from a very young age was, was, uh, un was unbelievable. And as a kid, he read, he heard a description. He, didn't, he wasn't even able to see a picture of this like we are. Of, and we're talking 18, uh, 50, say, six, uh, 60. This is a little later. It probably didn't look much different. But he heard a description of Niagara Falls. And Tesla, as a child, thought, if you, the amount of, just not even seeing a photo of it, but hearing a description of it, if you could capture all the power that was in there. And probably at the time, he was thinking of capturing it in mechanical means, uh, like air pressure or something, something physical. Uh, you could do a lot with that. And as, as a child, that was his dream. And he, he thought about that a lot, I think, growing up. So... In 1873, he finished his high school. This is him a little bit later, but it's really hard to find pictures of him young. Um, so yeah, in contrast, he's a lot better looking than Edison. Uh, and and he, uh, he was a great, stu great student. Uh, I have in my notes here in quotes, normal looking. Uh, so in contrast to Edison, right? So he did a great job. Graduated high school a year early. Uh, and his, he was actually accused, uh, this, is, this one is from Wikipedia, so I don't know if this is true or not, accused of, of cheating uh, because he was able to do integral calculus in his head. So in high school, he was doing, doing stuff that people thought, you can't, you can't really be doing this, Tesla. Uh, but the truth is, he was. So he graduates high school and gets cholera. Uh, he's very sick. Uh, he's on his deathbed at, at 17, and his father says, Nicola, if you don't die, you don't have to go into the clergy. You can go to engineering school. And so, miraculously, Tesla says, okay, I, I can live for that. So the option of, of leaving, uh, leaving Croatia, going to engineering school, and actually being able to, to, to realize some of these dreams that he was having uh, w w helped him, helped him, helped him uh, survive. Okay, so he goes... Uh, Goes and stretches, uh, sorry, gets, gets drafted, avoids the draft, goes out and lives in the woods. I'm going to have to rush now because we're, I'm getting the time thing. Um, he eventually makes it to Budapest, and this is where he finds this same tool to telegraph. So both of these guys, now, here's a parallel. They both discover telegraphy, and they say, wow, this is where I can shine. This is Tesla immediately gets to the office, and he says, you're doing it this way. It starts to make uh, starts to make additions, starts to make corrections to, to the whole system that they're using. So there we are, 1881. His bosses say, "Tesla, you're great. Go to Paris. We can get you a job with the Continental Edison Company." Wait a minute. So this is 1881. 
Last time we saw Tesla, sorry, Edison was 1873. What happened in these eight years so that Edison went from just being a kid learning how to use telegraph and now he is, now he's got a, play, a company called the Continental Edison Company. Well, what did he do? He's, uh, sorry, here's, there's, there's what he was. First, his telegraph system is now running from New York all the way to Charleston, South Carolina. He says, wait a minute, I have an idea. Since right now telegraphs can only work in half duplex, meaning we can send it one way and then wait, and then send it the other way, let's make it so it can work in full duplex. And he figures we just use two different voltages, that we can tell the difference between two different voltages. Now we've got two different signals going simultaneously both directions. Then he says, hey, let's make it quadruplex. We can do it not only two different voltages, but two different polarities. So he takes Western Union, who's sending one message at a time, waiting for it to end, and now making it so four messages can be sent simultaneously. So basically, he takes our bandwidth and multiplies it by four. And so Western Union is saying, holy shit, that's awesome. <laughs> Basically, our entire, our entire industry just quadrupled without any change to any of our equipment. So that's, that's uh, Edison, that's gigantic. That's his first major, major pattern where he makes some dough. Then he invents the electric pencil. It's like a carbon copy device. I, I don't know. This one is really scary, actually. That's a battery in the back. Uh, it looks like you just put paper down and, and uh, it kind of perforates through the paper. Okay, I'm not going to spend any time on that one. He's got this one. Edison starts coming up with this idea called the... Uh, uh, etheric effect, uh, which eventually is, is radio. So uh, everyone says, oh, Tesla was working on radio before Marconi was. Well, Edison was too. All these guys are working on very similar things. Uh, this is it, though. This is what Edison does, and he says, this is, this is the, his biggest moneymaker. This is the thing that, uh, that is his favorite invention that he ever makes. Um, and it's, uh, this is the, uh, the tinfoil phonograph. And so late one night, in Edison Laboratory, uh, he's got people, and it's, it's actually, he's not the hands that put this together. This is his concept, and he had a bunch of really excellent engineers who are working on this. And uh, for me, I, would, I don't want to leave out, for me, one of the, my favorite moments in, in human history is the moment that all the people making this, uh, trying to develop this phonograph, where they're basically running a needle across tinfoil and, and with a cone on it and screaming into the cone, and then running it again and seeing if the scream comes back. Over and over and over, 24 hours a day. And then there's one time that the scream comes back. That's the moment. That's the moment where they say, holy shit, we can, we can actually do this. We can record sound and reproduce sound. And so the, the change that that makes on not just, uh, not just technology, but an entire art form is, is not to be uh, underestimated. So this is Edison at that point. He's looking a lot more normal. <laughs> with, his, with his improved phonograph, it's got this awesome flywheel at the end. Because when you're recording or when you're playing back, there's no capstan motor, like what we call it now. There's nothing to regulate it, so you're really doing it. Um, and they did it 60 RPMs because it was about the same as your heartbeat. Okay. Then also in 19, 1879, he invented this. So whatever. <laughs> okay, 1882, Tesla, <laughs> Tesla is in Budapest. Uh, He's in Budapest, and, and he, he suffers a, uh, a, a, a sort of a nervous breakdown. Uh, he has his vision. He says, we can do this thing. We can do an AC motor. And the AC motor, uh, I have to kind of like brush through the science a little bit. Uh, it, it was incredibly more powerful and incredibly more efficient than a DC motor. Direct current is DC, and that's really great because you can store it. You can put it in batteries. Uh, it means that, like on a battery, current always flows from as in our convention, the, the positive terminal of the battery to the negative terminal of the battery, always in one direction. In alternating current, which is what comes out of our wall, it changes direction 60 times a second. It comes out of one of those blades in your uh, wall and into the other, and then it reverses direction, and that happens 60 times a second. That's why fluorescent lights have a hum, and that's why uh, a lot of uh, improperly working stereo equipment has a hum, or guitar amplifiers, things like that. Um, so Tesla has this image, draws it for a friend in sand with a stick. Uh, he's working now in, the, in Paris at the Edison Machine Works. Um, and this is, I thought this was a great image. This is what's going on inside the Machine Works. Rather than having a, a power outlet at each person's desk, they have a, a belt going down to their desk, and that's their power outlet. And they probably had a little thing on their desk and a clutch that they can engage or disengage it. So they're using completely mechanical power distribution rather than electrical, which is what we use now. So that was a really um, great idea. So he, he gets there. While he's there in Paris, 
Tesla introduces this. He says, this is it. This is the AC, uh, power, AC motor, AC generator. If you put power into it, you get movement out. If you put movement into it, you get power out. Both are alternating current. And I'm going to talk about what that is in a second. Tesla goes to America. This is the ship he rode on, the city of Richmond. And he meets Edison. Uh, he comes, he's working for the Edison company in Paris. And they say, uh, Tesla, you're good. I mean, you're really good. We can get you an interview with the man himself, Edison. So he comes down and he says to, uh, says to Edison, hey, uh, I got this AC thing. Edison says, I, I can't use it right now, but, but uh, come work for me. I'm getting the call to, be, to stop, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can do one minute here. Oh, God, how can I do this in one minute? Uh, the, the, he, ten, uh, Edison promises Tesla 50 grand if, if you can improve his DC motor design. And Tesla says, sure, I, I can do that. I can, I can replace your DC motor design with an AC motor design, but we'll get to that later. Uh, he does it. He fixes it. Edison says, sorry, Tesla, that was a joke. I'm not actually going to pay you the 50 grand. <laughs> Tesla quits and gets a job as a ditch digger. He, he can't find work. Uh, he has a year doing this. Please ignore the car. That's not, this is a kind of anachronistic photo. It was the oldest, this is the oldest photo of people digging a ditch I could get, sorry. Uh, Tes Tesla meets George Westinghouse from Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh says, yes, Tesla. He's the first one who says, yes, AC, I, I, I'm kind of behind that. Uh, we can make this work. It gives him 25 grand and has him come out to Pittsburgh. Uh, oh God, all right. I just want to get to like the real, sorry, I know I'm feeling the time pressure here. Comes to, comes to Pittsburgh, gets a bunch of money, comes back to New York, and moves into the Astor House. That's the Astor House in the middle. That's uh, St. Peter's, St. Paul's, the one in Wall Street, the one next to World Trade Center on the left there, the old one. And then this other stuff is gone now. This is where the Woolworth building is right here. Whoosh, whoosh. So that's Astor House. That's the nicest hotel in New York. Tesla's back in New York with dough. He's ready to, he's ready to like push this AC thing. So here we are. And here we are. <laughs> and here we are. So quickly, the idea is this. God, I should, if I'm going to skip anything, maybe I'll skip this. But the, the idea is this. You, oh, I, I can't explain this stuff right now. Here, here, it is in, here it is in 10 seconds. Alternating current, you can change the voltage. You can say, jump it up to 8 billion volts and then send it over to Montana and then drop it back down to 100 volts and then use your hair dryer. You can't do that with DC. When, when you're using, uh, and the, when you jump the voltage up, the current goes down. So like, if you wanted to transport water to Montana, this is, here's my thing. You could throw a bucket, but not, not a lot of it would make it. But if you had a super soaker, more of it would make it. <laughs> okay? So that's, 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 that's it. Pressure. Voltage is pressure, and cur current is amount of, of water particles. Both ways you're going you're gonna to get work done. Okay, that's it. And so that's, my, that's that, right? Uh, so, so that's transformer, we can't do that. Edison hears about it and he gets pissed. He says, all right, uh, Westinghouse, uh, we got to take it on Westinghouse. We can't do it. Uh, DC, oh God, I'm like so rushed right now. D DC uh, is incredibly wasteful because when you throw the bucket, you lose a lot of water. Um, but Edison's put a lot of money into DC. So he says, let's just smear uh, AC. So he says, hey, let's, let's get a guy electrocuted and we'll, we'll come up with a nickname Westinghouse, that we're going to Westinghouse this guy. Because Westinghouse is Tesla's boss and is trying, pushing for AC. They fry the guy, it takes 17 minutes. Uh, it's awful. Westinghouse, uh, his quote was, they would have been better with an ax. Um, Tesla this time is, is doing stuff that would lead to radio. He's, he's transmitting electricity through the air. Um, and uh, then the, this is the battle here. The, it culminates in 1893, the World's Fair in, in Chicago. Uh, in Chicago, so they want to do electric light for the World's Fair. GE, which is uh, Edison, and Westinghouse, which is Tesla, both put in bids. W Westinghouse was cheaper because they're using AC. They got it. They lit it up. And then in one final fuck you, Edison says, hey, you're going to use light bulbs for that? Well, you can't use the screw-in type because I patented that. So you're screwed. And then Westinghouse says, no, we're not screwed because we can just invent this thing and it works just as fine. So they said, bing, bang, boom. Here we are, World's Fair. Grover Cleveland flips the switch. Woo! Uh, <laughs> um, so also, finally, uh, Tesla says, uh, after this, they win the bid for Niagara Falls. And Tesla gets to build these uh, incredible AC generators at Niagara Falls, capture all the power of Niagara Falls, power Buffalo, which is an incredibly huge industrial city. 
Uh, I'm not going to talk about the, the contract, but here we go. After, after that, Tesla says, hey, we can do, uh, do x-rays. <laughs> Edison, says, Edison says, hey, we can do fluoroscopy, which is moving x-rays. Tesla says, hey, we can do radio control. This is in Madison Square Garden, the original one, where um, the uh, New York Life building is now. Edison says, hey, we can make moving pictures, including this moving picture. And I would be loath to not show this to you. Close your eyes if, you, if this is going to be too disturbing. So this is Edison, 1903, way after the War of the Currents is over. Westinghouse has won. Tesla's won. Edison kind of in one last thing is like, we just still want to show that even though AC won and everyone's got AC in their house, AC is still dangerous. And so this elephant topsy from Luna Park in Coney Island had killed a couple of trainers. One of them had fed it a lit cigarette butt. So that's why it killed him. Uh, topsy killed him. And so they electrocuted Topsy. And uh, they first fed him some cyanide, cyanide laced carrots. Don't look if you don't want to look. I didn't make it. Edison made this. He's, he's sleeping and, and he's really high, see? Okay, so, so one last thing. So that's Edison, after losing the War of the Currents, uh, still, still is, is like, is bitter about it and wants to get back at Tesla. There's one last thing he does though. Tesla, <laughs> he's got, there, there's one building in New York that still has direct current up until the 60s. And this is his hotel, the New York Hotel, right near Madison Square Garden, a beautiful hotel. They've got a, they have a, uh, a DC generator in the basement and the, it run, it's the DC and it's still DC up until the 1960s. The New Yorker finally converts to AC after Tesla dies. Tesla dies because when he's living in the New Yorker. Tesla spends the last 20 years in his life. Maybe Edison and his son kept it DC just to put a, just to twist that knife, Tesla. <laughs> Say, you know, you may have won, buddy, but, uh. We got it. And who, who ran the uh, electricity for this building? A little company called Con Edison. <laughs>